some of you. I haven't met some. My name is Roberta Gorin. I'm the volunteer coordinator for RESET. Um, I haven't done much with the PTO group because you sort of do your own thing, which is great for me. Uh, but we have a lot of volunteers in other schools, and it's an individual placing them in schools and working with them. So this is this is great. This is a wonderful program, and uh, I'm pleased to be here and to meet all of you. Uh, John Mahar, our executive director, uh, couldn't be here, so he asked me to come in his stead. Until he gets here, he'll be here eventually. And we have four panelists uh, today. Let's see. Our subject is, sorry, John sent me all these pieces of paper. How to connect with children with science, which is perfectly appropriate, uh, since that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and you know half of the panelists anyway, I'm sure. And uh, so uh, Peter, and I have a his vitals here, but do you want them? <laughs> That's okay. I mean, look, some people here are, are, are new, new members. So. New members. Okay. So maybe if we can each I, just uh, get one. You want to give your own? Okay. Let me just say, Peter, Juan, John, and Ed. Uh, John is on the uh, reset board. And uh, I have all their vitals here, and if you want to read that, that's fine. But they know more what to say about themselves <laughs> than I do. And we'll let, just let them begin. And as far as I'm concerned, you can introduce yourselves and carry on. I'm Pete Maraberry. If you need, a, if you need oh, help, I'll help. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm one of the co-chairs for the PTOS Reset Group. Um, the PTOS started Reset about two years ago, and with that, we kind of joined with some of the other affinity groups. Now we have SHIP and APN also for the past almost a year and a half now? Yeah, almost two years now. I've also been doing it. So we have two reset groups within the patent office itself. Um, and as Roberto was saying, reset is more of a local community group that's in DC and the Greater Virginia, but we have our in Maryland. But we have our own little small community here at the patent office, which is a little different, which we'll probably talk about later on the differences. That's kind of my background in I'm an electrical engineer, um, then terminating out examiner. And I, don't know, I grew up loving science, so this is kind of a whole thing, me giving back to how I was raised in a very pro-science household. Uh, my name is Juan Valentin, and uh, I've been a patent examiner here at the USPTO for almost 10 years. Uh, my background is in mechanical engineering from upstate New York. Um, I am the current education and outreach coordinator for the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. USPTO professional chapter. Um, that role kind of just, uh, I guess, found me, or I found it, we found each other. Um, I just, I don't know, I, I wanted to get back. I was getting a little bored here with work, and I needed something else to, to kind of get me going. And I found Reset through um, PTOS and APA Net. We, we've, uh, we meshed with APA Net to form our own group team, and then the PTOS has already been doing it, so they've helped us out a lot. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, we're trying to grow it, and it's a wonderful thing. So. Good afternoon, John Newby. I am a board member for Reset, and first of all, I'd like to say on behalf of the board and everyone involved, thanks so much for helping us out with our mission. I think it's a very important mission, and, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting mission, and it hopefully puts a smile on your face as much as it puts a smile on the face of the kids who you help. Um, my background, um, my degree is in political science. But it's a little bit deceiving. I went to the Air Force Academy. I was in the Air Force for a while. I was an electronic warfare officer on the B-1 bomber for a few years. Did some activities over in the sandbox. Got out, left that, went to law school, and then pursued my career as a, a, a patent attorney and a litigation attorney in a few law firms. Right now, I work up in Roslyn, Virginia, in Arlington, at a defense contractor as their head of intellectual property for, for their legal group. Uh, so that's a little bit of background. My name is Ed Rock. I'm uh, with uh, currently with the National Science Teacher Association, and we're also located just right up in Roslyn, right next to Roadside Bar and Grill. That's the one that I mark. Everybody yeah, seems right. to know. Um, I've been in uh, some way, shape, or form science education for about 30 years. I started out at the aquarium in Chicago. I have a degree in undergraduate degree in biology and psychology, and a master's in community mental health. 
but I scuba dove and kept home aquarium fish a lot. And uh, I ended up working at the aquarium where I got to lead dive trips to the Caribbean. It was a dirty job, but somebody had to do it. You know? And, um, you know, went from there into publishing uh, with, uh, and, and all science education materials, elementary, middle school, high school, um, and college level materials. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, also I'm a reset volunteer. Uh, I had a group in, uh, in uh, uh, Greenbrier uh, in Virginia, in, in Arlington. Um, and just, you know, it's just thrilling. Uh, to work with kids and, and the whole, you know, a lot of teachers are hesitant, uh, especially at the elementary level, to teach science because they don't understand the concepts well and they're not able to be passionate about it because they don't have the level of comfort with the content. And that's really what we all can bring to the table is that level of passion and excitement and fun, you know. We are all scientists or uh, science people in some way, shape or form. Um, absolutely love the subject and, and share that love with the kids, and that's what makes the difference. I'd like to first talk about sort of the how we how reset works and how we teach the kids. Um, the R in reset is for retired, but as I'm kind of, I wish it's, I was, but it is to retire. Working on hard. Working hard. Yeah, to work hard. <laughs> um, here at the patent office, um, we. We use current members. We we travel once a month, uh, about two hours to um, a local school. The P2S uses uh, Whittier Elementary and um, Langdon, Langdon, Langdon Education Campus, yeah. both in DC. And uh, we teach third and fourth graders right now. Um, we teach about five experiments per semester, where we'll go to their school, uh, groups of us, about five volunteers per classroom. Spend about an hour and a half teaching experiments, setting up, prepping for it, um, and then, then we come back, and we come back to production. It's the patent office. <laughs> but um, it's a nice break, at least, um, for the month, and you get to see the kids smile and be excited about science, but we also kind of get out of the office and be with other people who are excited about teaching kids science. And um, it's a little different than um, some of the other people. So for us, the patent office is more of a group, it's a team. So you're not by yourselves, you're not one-on-one -on -one with a screaming class of third graders. who are really excited about science, but with a team you get some more control, some more hands-on, maybe one of five, one of four groups of kids. So I mean, for me initially when I started, I was a little nervous about teaching all these kids, I mean, running around, I mean, I never taught little kids before. But having support of your team there, it really makes the experience a lot easier, on us at least. And it's a nice time for that. One, do you need? Um, so our, our reset team is a little newer, um, so we, last year we had a lot of support and we were able to work in teams. Um, this year was, uh, we're gonna, we struggled a little to get um, volunteers to come out, and sometimes there were two or three of us for a group of 50 kids, um, but we, uh, we made it happen, and it was fun running back and forth, you know, <laughs> making sure everyone's interactive, answering questions, calling out kids to come up and help us out, so um, it was cool, it was fun, um, but definitely if, if we can get some more volunteers, it is, you're right, um, last year it was when you have like six or seven kids to work with, they're definitely, you can, they, you can teach them more and they'll pick up on so. um, I actually have not done any work directly in the schools, I, I kind of just help at the board level, so maybe Ed can talk about his experience. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I uh, had two after school programs that I did uh, last semester. Um, 20 kids in the first group of three weeks and then uh, 15 kids in the second group of three weeks. And really, it was a pretty open-ended kind of thing. It was after school. It wasn't tied directly to their uh, school curriculum. And so we're asking the kids what were they interested in, what were they excited about, what did they want to learn more about. Um, there was a fairly wide age range in the group, too. They were from uh, th third graders up through eighth graders. Um, the eighth grade girl in the last group was just angry the whole time. You know, this is boring. This is, uh, right up until the, the culminating activity we did was, um, have you ever done fish printing? Clearly no. Um, so you take a dead fish, and it, it's a famous, it, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a Japanese art form called goitaku. And you cover the fish in ink, and you take a beautiful piece of rice paper, and you print the fish and it looks just gorgeous. You don't have to know how to paint or anything. You just prop stuff up and you, you capture the scale pattern and, and all that kind of stuff. And then you dissect the fish. 
And everybody's, you know, a lot of the kids in the class had fished with their dads and they had gutted fish, but they'd never dissected the fish. They never looked at what the parts were. And this eighth grade girl, first, you know, we were all printing the fish and she was, I don't want to do that. And all of a sudden at the end, she said, can I do one? <laughs> and so, you know, all of a sudden you start sucking her in. And, you know, and then we started doing the dissection and we had the 15 kids around the table and I was doing the cutting and they were just riveted. The parents were coming in. We were starting to run a little late, but the parents were looking over the edge, and they were interested in where everything went. And um, you know, the level of enthusiasm—that's what it all—it's all about—is is trying to get that one kid who was still in the back of the room and kind of you know disgusted or uh, disinterested or felt that it was boring, and slowly bringing them into it. Sometimes you have to be really patient. It took three weeks to get her to come out of her shell and get focused, and it wasn't until the last 30 minutes of the last day that she really riveted in. But um, we got them all, you know, and, and it, patience and enthusiasm and passion, that's what it's all about. Now, it, they wanted, uh, John asked me to talk a little bit about the standards and frameworks. Okay. Do we, do we care, or is that No, go no, ahead. Um, I, I've got more information than you'll ever want to know. Go ahead. But since I printed it out, I, I figured I'd give it to you. Um, there's uh, every teacher, whether they're in D.C. or if you just pass those back, whether they're in uh, D.C. or Maryland or Virginia, um, have a set of standards they have to perform to. And the kids have to, uh, to address those standards on their performance tests. The tests are called high-stakes tests. And the reason they're called high-stakes tests is sometimes the kids can be held back. And other times, teachers will, their raises will be dependent on their students' test scores. So those are pretty high stakes. And so when you say, hey, can I do this activity with the kids to the teacher, the teacher will ask, what standards does it cover? In Virginia, they have the best standards. They're called SOLs. So if you don't pass them, <laughs> um, the standards of learning uh, is the real name. Of them. But uh, D.C.'s got a set. Uh, Maryland's got a set. And there is a new process coming around uh, or coming about uh, the National Research Council produced a thing called the K-12 Framework for Science Education. And that's what you have on the top hand out there. Um, <clears throat> when we were all in school, everybody talked about the scientific method. And let's see if we can all say it together. Hypothesize. Keep going. <laughs> and so, so let's all embrace how much we remember the scientific method. Um, what we used to do is we used to teach a lockstep scientific procedure. Now, for those of you who have gone on and got a degree in science and actually did an experiment, did you follow a lockstep procedure? No. No. Science is iterative. A lot of times all you do is read, you know, to get background. Sometimes you're going to do an activity. As the activity crashes and burns, you learn more about the process you were trying to learn about than where the real process would have taken you anyway. And so the whole idea here in the new K-12 framework is that we're really starting to take a look at practices. The other thing that we found was teaching science in, in outside of a context um, is difficult. So if I was only going to teach photosynthesis as a chemical process that takes place within a plant cell, that's okay. But if I talk about it in the context of you wouldn't be alive today, what's your name? Dennis wouldn't be alive today without photosynthesis. Do you eat salads occasionally? Yes. There you well done. Well done. <laughs> and, and, and so salads are, you know, photosynthesis, and you start getting the kids involved in how the sunlight interacts with plants and how the plants generate uh, sugars from the sunlight through a process called photosynthesis, and then all of a sudden you start talking about a context. Well, one of the other ways you can give context is by taking a look at the science in the context of a problem that society may have. And that's all you guys do here at the Patent Office, take a look at all the different kinds of solutions people try and generate that solve society's problems. Um, and so the new set of frameworks is taking a look at both scientific practices, and I listed them there for you just so in case, you know, it, it start ringing bells, and engineering practices um, and how those work. And there's a thing called problem-based learning, where you may say, we're going to build a bridge out of toothpicks and marshmallows in class. And we're going to see whose bridge can sustain or, or uh, support the most weight. 
But as we do that, we're also going to learn a little bit about force and motion, which is a science concept, and it's a standard that you have to learn about in fifth grade in, in Virginia. <laughs> um, we're also going to learn about measurement, because we're going to have to look at different weights and measures, standardized weights and measures. We're also going to probably chart and graph everybody's performance, because your bridge is probably going to be much stronger than your bridge. And you know, so then we'll be able to see a chart and a graph, and we'll be able to compare the design features of yours compared to yours. And then we'll have a conversation or an argumentation uh, using the evidence we saw about which design might be best and how can we improve and optimize our design. And so what I've just done is kind of moved between engineering and science back into the engineering design process and those kinds of things. Okay, so that's, actually, okay, yeah. Hold on a second. We actually did that this semester with the kids at Whittier. We, um, we had the kids use uh, candy materials, different types, with toothpicks. And the kids got to experiment and build bridges with them. We actually did the exact same. Um, we used different types of candy, so the kids could compare, <coughs> oh, Starburst works better than gumdrops or better than marshmallows. And that the kids charted it, and the best thing was seeing the kids' reaction to, oh, my bridge broke under this much, or a lot of the bridge is really good, and then the why. Why was that better? And these kids are in fourth grade, still wondering, being excited about the ex experimentation, the, the trial and error. That's key, I think. And what I will also say is that there's a big movement these days, uh, uh, and, and, and the phrase they use is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and raise your hand if you enjoy math. Raise your hand if you know that math is the universal language that empowers almost every job in our technological society today. <laughs> okay. And so what kids, you know, math can be a life-sucking subject. Um, you could suck the life right out of a fourth grade classroom. <laughs> um, but when you start doing activities that are using real-world data that the kids really enjoy and are focused on, and care about, all of a sudden the math takes on an active, applied life. And getting kids as excited about math as you can get them about the science activities are equally important because, quite frankly, the one biggest limiting factor isn't enthusiasm, it's math ability when you get up into the high school and college level. Um, and so the more enthused and more accepting kids are of math, that's a good thing too. Um, Cross-cutting concepts um, are the other big uh, area that the, that the uh, uh, new framework talks about. And these aren't anything new. There was a program from the American Association for the Advancement of Science called Project 2061. Its goal was to make every uh, citizen in the United States science literate by the next time Halley's Comet comes back in 2061. So we still have a couple years to go and see if we can get there. But the cross-cutting concepts are things like patterns. So, um, are there any patterns? Who, who here has any life science background? Knows a little bit about plants? Okay. Um, what kind of patterns do you see that you could easily just sprout out about plants? Germination, seed germination, or um, like photosynthesis, or okay. um, leaf types. Yeah, color Leaf changes. Types, color changes, yeah. you know, all kinds of different, you know, um, uh, physical science, uh, physics, engineering people. What kind of patterns do you see in? Well, I remember in my uh, like junior and senior year of college, I noticed yeah. that uh, whether you're talking about the fluid flow yeah. through a pipe, uh -huh. or talking about the vibrating head of a drum, yeah, it's the same second order differential equation. The constants mean something different. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, there, there are similarities. Crystalline structures, you know, there are similarities. There's, there's all it, bridge structures. Did er, all the kids in fourth grade eventually come to the point where they said triangles are really important? Well, we, we, uh, we actually did a, have an educational thing at the beginning to kind of kids, give kids some more background. So we showed them a little square, a little flattened square, and then a triangle, and then a cube, and then a pyramid. So the kids at least had some basis going into their mm -hmm. trial and error to know, okay, this is better than that. And then from that, they could see, when they tested it out, that, yeah, the triangles and the pyramids are the best. Science education research tells us that, you know, it's important to learn, you know, the process of photosynthesis. But if as, I, if, as I'm learning the process of photosynthesis, the chemical process of photosynthesis, sunlight, carbon, carbon dioxide, and all that kind of stuff, um, I'm also understanding that it's a cycle. 
Then when I start taking a look at geology at the Earth cycle, where you've got molten rock coming out of a, coming out of a volcano, and it's cooling and crystallizing, and it slowly moves across the face of the Earth in geologic timescales of millions of years, and then eventually goes into a subduction plate uh, in his return to the, to the magma at the center. You know, all of a sudden kids start seeing a connection that there is a cyclical nature to many things in nature. Um, those big cross-cutting ideas are things that as you're talking about the bridge, you may also want to talk about some broader cross-cutting ideas about just general structures and stability of structures and looking at patterns perhaps and, and, and those kinds of things. Or as you do an activity with, you know, fish. Um, you can take a look at life cycles, or you can take a look at the patterns of, uh, of uh, scales and those kinds of things, or the similarities and homologies between a fish's anatomy and a human's anatomy. And kids can see then there are similarities, and so that cross-cutting idea allows kids to see from one common and understood experience, if I have a new and novel experience, there is some similarity with that cross-cutting idea. And then the third thing are core concepts. Um, these are all of the concepts in the framework. This is all of them. And so you think, wow, piece of cake. Um, but as you take a look, you know, Earth's place in the universe is a pretty complex concept. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, you can go from, I can see the moon and I can see the sun and I kind of have a feel for how that Earth-Sun-Moon system works and how night and day seems to work here on Earth. And that's a first, four, you know, first through fourth grade concept. But if you're starting to talk about celestial mechanics and how all the planets move in concert uh, with the gravitational forces of the sun and everything else in the universe, and how we can predict the orbit of Pluto uh, based on the perturbances of the orbits of Mars, that's some, you start getting into those kind of equations you were talking about, very different kind of science. And so um, when you take a look at these um, phrases here, keep in mind that there is always a grade level appropriateness for the content you might be teaching. Um, you may have learned all the way up to this level, but you have to remember, and that's where it's always great to work with the teacher to figure out what the level the kids are at. Um, because the one thing you don't want to do is speak over the kids. Um, a couple other things that you can just read at your leisure. Um, there's a whole bunch of resources that STA has on our website. There are a whole bunch of resources that the National Research Council has on their website. They're all free to download. And then achieve.org. Now there's the framework, which is the guiding document, the research-based document. And now there's a thing called the Next Generation Science Standard, which is being written as we speak. About 28 states have already signed on to write and uh, carefully review and potentially adopt it, um, much like the Common Core. Is anybody familiar with what's called the Common Core Math and Language Arts Standards? Those are standards that have been adopted by the National Governors Council and pretty well ubiquitously with the exception of Texas, of course. Um, because they can't do anything else that anybody else does. And it's not even political, they just don't want to. Um, but the Common Core standards for math and for language arts mean that there's a fairly consistent now set of standards, grade K through 12, in English, language arts, reading, and mathematics. This Next Generation Science Standards project is something similar to that that many states will adopt, and then there will be a, a consistency. What we found is that there's a lot of transients. Um, kids move from one city to another city, from one state to another state, and so to provide a consistent K-12 education for our mobile population here in the United States, that level of consistency is really important so that if I'm learning one thing in first grade somewhere, it'll be comparable in some other place. Um, and so here's a place to take a look at some of that information. The approximate timeline is, you know, and this is almost geologic terms like we were talking about before, uh, between now and the end of this year, uh, there will be drafts of the next generation standards. Then they'll go to the state. Those will be absorbed by the states. They'll be taken a look at and they'll be adopted. Once they're adopted, a whole set of assessment standards need to be written. And then they'll be implemented. So about 2015 or 16. But almost every teacher in the United States is starting to look at this and say, I need to start paying attention to it. And so if you go back to that first page, 
And as you're building activities and thinking it through, think about those practices. What science and engineering practices are you addressing? It's important to be intentional. You know, doing a fun activity is always enjoyable. But if you think through intentionally what the, what the practices you're teaching are, science and engineering practices, what the, what the uh, cross-cutting concepts are that you may want to make sure you reflect on with your kids, and what the uh, common core ideas are that relate to the teacher's standards that they're accountable for, and the broader issues, you'll really make a difference. You'll really make a difference. One last editorial thing that I wanted to say, if you turn to that last page, Words matter. And when I say words matter, there are two, you know, lightning rod topics, evolution and climate change right now, um, that you always get you in trouble. And what I want to do is just give you two words. I accept the science that supports evolution. I have lots of beliefs in lots of different things. I want to believe that there are dragons out there still. I want to believe that magic's possible. But I don't accept that it is because I haven't seen any evidence. It's important to remember that words matter. When you're talking to kids, words matter. And so as you're talking to kids and sometimes these kinds of concepts will bubble up, be very comfortable about talking about science, the evidence that's related to science, the acceptance we have of science ideas and theories and those kinds of things. And also draw a very clear distinction between what science is and what wishes, hopes, and beliefs are. Um, because if you don't have that clear distinction, sometimes you can get into some trouble in the classroom. I've got a whole bunch of other, um, some activities and those kinds of things you're welcome to grab on the way out. Um, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah. Um, sorry for coming late. I'd like to get a presentation as well. Sure. But um, have you ever given some consideration to looking at like maybe the DOD standards, if you're going to put together a common core? Because about 10 years ago, actually about 20 years ago, um, the largest DOD system, I mean the largest public school system was DOD. Yeah. Because they answered that question about transferring kids from not just one kid yep. across the country, but across the world, mm -hmm. and having uniform standards. Have you examined that? And maybe you can accelerate that timeline from 2016 to something a little bit closer? Uh, the, uh, the DOD standards were driven off the set of national standards that were created back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and this is just an evolution of those standards. Okay. So yeah, all that learning has been taken into consideration. I should like to comment on the reset. Is, at least for us, is a little more about like it's amazing. It's like I wish we could have the standards like across the country. But like for us right now, our goal is to get that first spark in the kids, that yeah. first enjoyment, so that they can actually think about the these big things. That's one. And talk a little bit about sort of things. You, Yes, well, from. I would, well, yeah, um, and thanks for that, by the way. That was really nice. Um, the standards, I try to match our project to the standards as best I can, but being a patent office employee also, we, we forgot to mention this earlier, we tie in our projects to intellectual property. Um, so that's another element, another dry subject such as that. <laughs> that when you bring up intellectual property to kids, um, they're kind of mouse drop and you're like, what, what world are we in? But um, so being able to build rockets or build circuits or teach about gravity and then you have a patent and you say, hey, look, this is a, a patent for a rocket and these fins help this rocket go higher or farther. So that's, that enables us to engage them with intellectual property and teach them at a young age the importance that you know, IP plays in our lives. Um, but yeah, it's just, working with third graders is amazing because this, it's already been alluded to, the smiles on their faces. I mean, it's just like, and a lot of times, most about a half an hour, they're sitting down, but once they get their hands into it, like, they kind of all rush in, and they all want to be a part of it, and they all want to, they all want a piece of the, the action, you know, they all want to learn, and they pick up fast on it, too. Um, and there's a lot of principles that we try to teach them on, but the main core things are, you know, just the, the actual science, technology, engineering portion of it. You know, that they can be a scientist if they want to. They can be an engineer. They can be a mathematician. It's fun. It doesn't have to be boring. Um, and showing them that real life things that they can do in their, in their home. It's like a lot of it's, most all of it's you want DIY, you know. So. I think that's a great comment about the patent office. Because, I don't know, after about a year now, it's fun to see the time kids, like, and ask me a question, what do we do? Like, Oh, you work at the patent office. 
And then, all right, kids, what does that mean? Oh, you protect people's inventions. I mean, when I was in third and fourth grade, I didn't know what a patent was, let alone what we did here. It's just fun seeing kids who would not have that education to, to know what a patent is, to know what a civil engineer is. Um, this semester, we try to incorporate different types of engineers into our experience, saying, all right, this is what a civil engineer would do. This is what an aerospace engineer would do. And having the kids know those words in third and fourth grade, to me, is just amazing. Just have that already that initial stepping stone. That's kind of what we try to do. And John, I'm actually curious. Um, have you heard anything from the superintendents or teachers about what they want or what they're looking for from us? Well, I think the biggest thing they want is exactly what we already give them, which is you guys um, in the schools. Because there is, especially for the schools that we target, reset. Um, or actually, very, should you mention a about the schools we target, just to give an idea? Oh, sure. Uh, so the schools we target, uh, Reset started by targeting primarily underserved under, uh, schools in the, in the east part of D.C. and then expanded into the surrounding areas. So, you know, let's just be blunt, they are primarily um, local forming, uh, lowly funded schools by the government, which tend to be attended by minorities and other disadvantaged um, groups that don't otherwise have exposure to science or anything else, quite frankly. Um, so those are the initial targets to reset, and it's still the targets to reset. And we've moved kind of beyond that in a little bit, but our core focus is on those schools that don't have, don't have what everyone else has, right? Um, so, uh, and I forgot the initial question that you asked me. I was asking you about what, what teachers and that's sure, what they want from us. What they want from us. They just want us, because most teachers in these schools don't have support for their science activities whether it be financial support, parent support, administration support. So the fact that we show up at the door, that we work with the administration, that we've gotten into the door to be in front of these kids is, is a miracle in itself in some, in some cases. But then once we show up and we do our thing, once you do your thing, and they see the reaction of the kids, that does filter back up to the principals and superintendents. And we're always getting good positive comments and feedbacks from the administrators and the staff and the teachers of, man, you guys are great. You guys really, you know, open the eyes of these kids. You guys brought someone in you can, you know, relate to them, right? Because they're sitting there all day as we did when we were in school, just listening to someone up there just doing this all day. And, you know, Miss Smith, she may be a great teacher, but we see her all the time. You know, what does she really know about science? That kind of thing. I mean, let's be real. Kids, kids think like that. When, when, when someone else comes in the door, whether it be an Ed with all of his years of experience or, or, or a young cat like these two guys over here, you know, that they can directly relate to as far as closer in age. It's a difference from what they see every day. I think you just hurt my feelings. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's a spectrum that they need. You know, they don't just need, you know, the nice, very educated and very well equipped in, in, in her education. You know, Miss Smith is, you know, they see every day. They need to see the, the broad variety of people who have had the world experience and folks who are probably more closer in age and probably more directly translate uh, you know, their kids speak because they are quite frankly younger than you or I. Um, and, and, and it really helps and it filters well up to the, to the teachers, the administrators, and, and the feedback that Reset gets all the time is fantastic. And, and the one piece of research that's pretty amazing is, is there's, and it's a pretty historical piece of research where you ask kids to draw what a scientist looks like. Yeah. And it's always Absolutely. a white guy with a tie and a lab coat on it. And the more the kids can see that um, there are women, there are African American, there are Hispanic, right. folks who are scientists, who are engineers, who care and love and enjoy science in all different kinds of ways, as opposed to Mrs. Smith, my teacher, um, makes all the difference in the world for them being able to identify why it's important. Yeah, um, I can attest to that. I, I teach in about three schools during a week in uh, D.C. robotics. and. Uh, Sometimes I, I, I teach about 70 kids throughout the week, the legal robotics, and what you're saying is true. I teach over at Ludlow, uh, Murray, National Christian Academy, and I do it on Sundays, volunteer. And what the kids find, they say, you're not there getting paid. They're like, why are you here? First the question is, why are you here? Because they don't see you as a teacher. And the enthusiasm, I'm teaching third graders, and all you, what you're saying is absolutely true. Um, you know, doing the robotics for the past year over at different schools, leaving here at PTO, and they see you coming in with all this stuff, and they're like, 
wow, and they don't feel threatened by you, you know, so they, they're a little more open, a little more excitable, they're not as, uh, how can I say, when you get them in, because I teach in the afternoons, after school programs at DC PC, PCS, and the biggest thing is having volunteers, I mean, I'm telling you, I, I have some students that come from Howard University that work with me, and what I'm reaching out for, because there's so many kids, when you go to the after school coordinators, the principals, they just, they're thirsting, they're just, they, they so bad need that interaction from someone who's actually done what you're teaching. And uh, it doesn't take a lot of time. I mean, a lot of people say, well, I don't have time. Well, who does? But if you can take an hour, and everybody can take an hour, then you're going to reach, and I do believe the seeds that you're planting. I mean, because sometimes you wonder, are you affecting any kids? Some days I leave the class like, oh, my goodness, you know, because <laughs> I relate to the screaming kids because it gets kind of crazy. But you got to believe that one day that some kid's going to come up to you and say you made a difference. Because I know for me and most of us here, we're engineer scientists because someone made an impact on us. And that's why we give back. So I guess my point is I really relate to what you guys are saying. is very, uh, very familiar with me because this is what I do daily. You know, I'm doing it three to four times a week. And I see the kids and just sometimes I wonder, it's, it's, it's like that slippery slope. Once you get started, next thing you know, you just... You're taking on more. You're taking on more. But that's what it's all about. That's what volunteering is about. You never get to a point where you feel like you're doing too much. Because that one smile, that one kid, that one, we got letters from superintendent of D.C. schools. It's great. I mean, we get, when we get those emails and we get those letters, it's like, wow, it is worth it. Whatever you can do. Because you're changing a kid's life just by showing up. You don't have to be brilliant. You don't have to have some great, you know, you know thesis. Those kids are just excited because you're there and you and you care. So I encourage you guys. In. Thank you. Yeah, thank, well, thank you. That is awesome that you're doing that, and I would love to talk to you after this and so <laughs> find out some more. Because we do robotics uh, here at the, at the USPTO, too, and PTOS has partnered with many of the affinity groups on really? robotics thing for E-Week last year. Okay. And I was actually in the school at Langdon talking to um, the STEM coordinator there and uh, one of the teachers that we were going to be working with setting, just to talk about the program, setting up what the framework was going to look like for the semester. And I had mentioned the, the Lego Mindstorms. And I said, it might be a little hard for us to bring them all to the school, but for your field trip, if you come here, we'd love to do it with you. And, and you do that. Yeah, that's why I want to talk to you. Five, ten, ten, so. <laughs> I had 10 on me in my car. I mean, I got Legos all over. The STEM coordinator's eyes just lit up when I mentioned Lego robots because they purchased a, a year before two, two $300 kits, and they had no idea how to use them. They had been collecting dust in the school. They're like, oh, please come, come teach us how to use these so that we, Langdon, education campus. And um, they're like, yeah, in DC. They're like, please come help us. And I was like, you know, we're gonna we're gonna hook up. But yeah, so um, uh, there's a need. And there's a need. Oh yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we have about four more schools that have requested us. Because once you get in that pipeline, the coordinators start talking, and then next thing you know, it's like I started just to do one, and I got ten schools, and that's why I'm going out. I, I'll put ads out on Craig was, I need volunteers, I go, that's the one reason I'm here, just to find out, ha, oh, I can't do it all. Right. But I, I can't stop because, you know, it's worth, you have a talent, it can be anything, it can be making paper, the kids just, it doesn't take much, the kids just get turned on. Well, I think it was, Are we allowed to ask questions? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have two questions. Question number one is, um, like you mentioned, teachers like Mrs. Smith, what do we have for teachers like Mrs. Smith? Because um, ultimately, they are interacting with that's students, right. yeah, and um, teachers cannot be ignored because that's what that's they right. are there for. So what are we doing to fill that gap, or what are we doing to right, coordinate the uh, Very briefly, at least, uh, before each semester, we talk to the STEM coordinator of the school to kind of get their idea of what they're going to be teaching when. Of school, and then we kind of mix and match our experiments based on that. And the teacher is in the classroom while we're doing the experiments. She's at least part of the, the action. She's kind of participating with it also. So she knows what the kids are learning, at least kind of has a background with it. So she's not out of the room. She's not at her lunch. She's with us with the experiment. So she also is getting experience with this basic technology, this basic science. So later on, she may say, oh, yeah, kids, remember when we did, when we did the clean water experiment? Or we made the dry ice ice cream, where the ice cream froze. And she's getting at least some background that she might not get otherwise as well. 
Um, I know for most of the experiments we do, we also develop like student guides and teachers guides, and we'll also give them to the teachers that they can use as supplemental material after we leave, that they can go over with their classrooms if they're not already comfortable with the material themselves. Um, Question two. Well, yeah, just one other follow-up. One of the reasons that it's important to know at least that there are standards and where they're at and all that kind of stuff is those are the things that will allow you to, you know, there are a lot of things that help you connect with kids, there are also things that help you connect with teachers. And being able to understand what the teachers are being held responsible for and those kinds of things will help you connect with them. That is their primary motivation, the standards. And once you realize that, you start speaking their standards language. Good. Um, my second question is, you know, ultimately everything in life should be based on self-reliance. If we can't teach somebody to be self-reliant, there's no point in doing anything at all. So. How do you test that? How do you give that to the kids? And how do you analyze it, like after six months or a year? That okay, I've given the kids enough of ability to think think about what, why, what, how, and come up with answers. I'll answer that, and, and probably this will help me answer one of the points or talk about one of the points that our executive director wanted to address. Um, we don't. There's really no way of, for us to measure that mm -hmm. particular thing. But the way we can help with that is just, we're not just showing up and showing them the experiment, I hope. We're giving our life stories, how we got to where we are. Um, we're telling the story of you know our background, how we got interested in science, how there wasn't really a lot of support for us to do it, but we did it anyhow, and bam, here we are. I think the story itself teaches the kids a little bit about self-reliance and, and, and taking the step necessary to, to, to pull your own self up, do what you have to do. Because look, you know, science is not the hip, cool thing in America, generally speaking, and specifically speaking in the schools that I came up with, right? You're kind of like the anomaly. You know, you're, you're the nerd, right? Um, but hopefully, by going and talking to the kids, um, they can hopefully see that sometimes it pays off being a nerd. And, and that's a real story that some kids don't ever see, right? So. I don't know if there's a way to measure the impact along those lines, but just having you there and telling your story and the context of the experiment hopefully helps somebody at the end of the day, and I think it does. I think one of the experiences I've kind of had with, with the, did they actually learn something, wasn't as much of the, did they learn this concept, was that uh, the second year we've, so, uh, so PTOS has been doing it for two years now, and this semester we had kids we had last year, so they've had two semesters with us. And seeing those kids stop competing for the win or loss, did their thing fail, did they, they, was theirs the best? It was not, oh man, I'm, I'm, I feel bad at myself because I lost. It was, wow, that was a little better. How did they do that? How can I get to that next level? What do I need to change so I get there? It wasn't the feeling depressed about their mistake. It was mistakes equal further gain. And to me, that was something that I noticed this year. Just, seeing the kids who have already been with us almost a year now. I like the aspect you mentioned earlier about like, giving the kids the first spark. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the questions I had since this, uh, and by the way, I'm with Patent and Trademark's office, Blacks in Government. Um, we weren't exactly, I think, on your original list, but we're one of the affinity groups here. Glad you're here. And um, we've been trying to do outreaches for the kids for the last two years. We work with Hamilton. Hammond Middle School and T.C. Williams, we have brought them in to show them, I'm actually a cybersecurity geek, but um, we brought them in to show them what the Patent and Trademark Office is, what the patent examiners do, and what the trademark um, attorneys do, as well as some aspects of cybersecurity. So one of the things we try to focus on, and this kind of goes into the self-reliance aspect, we try to work with the junior high and the high school kids what we call a flag program, Future Leader in America's Government, We're trying to get them into the STEMs, but actually working for the government. And one of the targets we use for the, the teachers when we try to get them to bring students over was we, we have excellent affinity groups here at the Patent and Trademark Office, and we have excellent programs for working with those bright kids that are already kind of like on the science edge. But I was wondering, how, you, how do you approach the kids that are in the middle? talking about the C students, because what we were trying to do is, and that's why I like what you said, that first spark, there's some kids in the middle school area, in the high school area, that aren't at C, they don't really know what they're going to do after school, and 
those are the ones we were trying to reach out and touch. Not just solely them, but we were trying to reach out to the kids that, with a little bit of encouragement, they might want to take that one math course, they might want to take that one science course, they might want to see like, hey, I can be a patent examiner or cybersecurity view. And I was wondering if you have an approach for how to target that particular demographic, because when you mentioned underserved schools, to me it's not just the underserved schools, it's that one kid who just doesn't have the encouragement to know where the heck I'm gonna go. Well, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you this much. Um, I, I appreciate the program that you're doing. I think the goal of RESET um, starts a lot earlier than that. So our, our hope is that we get them early enough, you know, third, fourth grade, that we've got their attention, and they keep that attention throughout their middle school, high school career with respect to STEM. Um, I don't think we are, not currently at least, at the point where we can um, try to do a pinpointed, targeted grab at those particular kind of students and help the student who's, who's right on the edge, may have some interest in science, but hasn't quite leapt over to totally embrace science and technology. So. Our goal is just broad, general exposure in the first instance, early enough, so A, kids aren't scared of science. They know this is a touchy-feely, real kind of thing. And B, even if they don't want to be scientists later in life, they're comfortable, right? So when they take their bio in high school or what have you, oh, I remember that experiment way back when with, with the frog or the fish. You know, okay, let's, let's, see, let's see what more I can learn. You know, they're not scared about it. So back to answering your question, I don't think Reset, Reset is not targeting that audience, the, the middle school, high school, you know, C student. We're, we're trying to get in there much earlier to at least just get broad exposure. Understood. I was yeah. looking also for advice. I can, I can tell you, I can tell you what I do as a, you know, as an instructor, a co-leader. Um, you know, you're, you only have an hour with these students and you try to make the most impact that you can in an hour, you know, the six times that you do see them throughout a semester. So there's 50 kids in this in this classroom and you, you answer questions and you, you get a quick feel of who's who's a little more ahead of, of others. They're raising their hands answering questions and you got the quiet ones, you know. So I try to pick out, I try to, and I don't, I'm not, I don't pick on them, but I try to encourage them to answer. And so I'll find them and I'll keep coming back to them. So maybe the first two or three weeks they're just kind of like, oh man, why are you calling on me? But by the end of it, you know, they're like raising their hand and they're, you know, they're picking up on it and they're answering. And at the end, they're like, oh, Mr. Juan, thank you, you know. So I'll try to, you know, I'll try to find, pick a few, you know, and you can't hit everybody, but you try to do your best and then make sure that everyone gets involved and, and, and is at least picking up on the concepts that you're trying to teach them. I just wanted to make one comment too. And I'm not, I'm not sure what type of experiments or activities that you do, but. With third and fourth graders, we try to do a lot of activities that designate each group member to participate in one aspect of the activity so that each group member therefore has a task and has to participate actively with whatever portion of that experiment or activity is. So um, it kind of forces them to be thinking about what's going on and listening, um, encouraging them to really be active. Actually, one of the challenges we had this year was the whole process of getting to every kid. Um, this semester, we, we tried to do a little more inventiveness, a little more trial and error in our experiments. We found that there are kids who really love it and kids who kind of just want to be told what to do. And, and even in third and fourth grade, it's finding that delicate balance between. And I mean, we're still trying to figure out the best way to do it. And I think it's a, it's, it's teaching. It's trying to get everyone taught as fast as possible, as efficient as possible. I, I just a little comment. It's hard for me to keep quiet. Um, uh, one time when I was teaching in the classroom, and we go in there sort of blind. We don't know who the, I mean, we have an idea of who the really smart ones are. They're, like you said, they're the ones that raise their hand. But sometimes they're not. And I got some feedback from a teacher after I had been working with these groups. And the student that was the most enraptured, involved, and participating in what was going on was one of the learning disabled students who found so, you know, something that wasn't 
reading, that wasn't uh, uh, writing, that was something that they could do. And it was, uh, it was very interesting that, that because what we do, what we do, irregardless of where they are, they're all, e uh, they can all respond in their own way, which is, which is something that, uh, you know, they do. You, you don't, you, you're, never, ne you're never sure when you plant the seed what's going to grow. Right, and I should mention that sometimes you'll pick on someone who's really quiet and they'll come out with the answer and you're just like, why didn't you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know? <laughs> Yeah, I like the comment about the seeds. I mean, that's, that's our goal with reset, is to plant as many seeds as possible. Yeah. If you don't plant them, it won't grow. I'd like to just go, it may be a bit of a change from the current path that we're going in the conversation, but another thing that our executive director wanted me to make sure to impart to everyone here is um, how much we appreciate the PTO, and he specifically wanted me to tell the story of how you guys got involved with us. Um, more, a little more than a couple of years ago, I was at a law firm here in Washington, D.C., uh, working as a patent attorney, a prosecutor, and, and a litigator. Um, and I had a co-worker of mine, Sidley Austin, right here in town. Um, he was a litigator, but his wife is a Ph.D. chemist who worked here at the PTO, Kendrick Carter. And uh, so, you know, I was part of Reset at the time, and we were looking for how to get more people involved and what have you. I was like, Let's see, I'm a patent attorney. I deal every day with the PTO. Heck, the PTO has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of really smart scientists. <laughs> They're not retired, uh, at least I hope. I mean, some may be retired on the job, but you know, that's, that's a different issue. Um, uh, as you know, lots of us are in other other professions. But it's like, gosh, these smart people. You know, why are we tapping into this? So I said, Kendra, hey, you know, hook me up with the PTO. Uh, so it was through, through Kendra Carter a few years ago and the connection to eventually wrap, wrap into these gentlemen here and, and you here that brought you on board to Reset. And, and I'll tell you a little bit of story about Reset and the initial reaction of um, bringing on the PTO. The question was asked, why are we bringing folks in who are not retired? The question was asked. My response was, A, I'm here on the board, and I'm not retired yet. Okay. And I hope I can still, you know, contribute in some way. But B, uh, we have to show kids the entire spectrum, from the well-seasoned, been there, done that, to the young and just getting started. All right, and the kids need to see that entire spectrum. Um, so I say all that to say, A, thank you on behalf of Reset for doing this. Uh, but I wanted to let you know that um, you guys are near and dear to my heart because of the fact that, you know, my particular background, uh, being the only patent attorney on the board, uh, the only guy with kind of my experience on the board. And um, I really appreciate having this team on board to help reset out. And I think it's been a great relationship so far, and hopefully it'll get just that much better in the future. Can I, can I add to that real quick? Um, and I know that, you know, reset is, um, in the eyes of DCPS is really a wonderful organization. Um, I had the privilege of serving on the, um, the DCPS uh, STEM Advisory Council, and I work with um, Kamsey Adams and Charity uh, Fessler, and um, they can't thank us enough for the work that we do here for, with Reset. Um, they, they love us and they wish we could grow, and we're trying to grow that relationship. Yeah. But we really truly are appreciated, and uh, your work does not go um, unseen you know, or unappreciated. On that note, um, I'm Christiane Pulliam. I'm the co-chair of the PTOS Education Committee, and Yara and I are the ones who started the relationship with Reset and brought in the other affinity groups. So hopefully you've signed in in the back and, um, you know, have given us your contact information for, you know, for the folks that work here and are possibly interested in joining our teams. All of our teams, we understand, and Yara, the reason we, we designed the program to be a little bit different than the way Reset reset work with retired folks. We're not teachers. We don't expect you to be. We're learning as we go in designing the experiments and things like that, but we're not putting you in the classroom by yourself. We practice the experiments before we go. You know what you're doing when you walk in, so you don't have to be concerned or intimidated by it. You know, I have a computer science degree, but we've done clean water, we've done airplanes, bridges, these are all different things, but 
the experience that we have, first off, the kids are third and fourth grade, so, you know, you can probably handle the science. <laughs> but, <laughs> but even so, you'll have experience with it beforehand, so you're comfortable walk with what you're walking into, and you can help answer all of their questions and really get that spark going. We had the kids here, we bring them here for their field trip at the end of the semester. And we had the group that we worked with in third grade and then in fourth grade. Some of them don't want to go to fifth grade because they, they figured out that we're not going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and they're a little bit upset about this. So we need more people so that we can be there in fifth grade. And so, you know, thank you all for coming here today and hopefully for signing in and we hope you join our teams. But also feel free to volunteer your friends to join you and you know it's not a huge commitment um, out of your flexible work schedule so hopefully you know you can uh, join us for a lot of fun and if you're not a people person oh, you're dead. if you're not a people person you don't have to talk you know you can just help out and pass out materials and you know answer the occasional question but you don't have to get out there and you know, voice yourself to 50 young kids staring at you, like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, um, so I missed, the earlier, I missed the earlier part of the introduction. Is the recent organization restricted within uh, D.C., Virginia, Maryland area, or is it? Currently. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, we, we, we've been approached by organizations outside of those three areas to expand and we're considering, but right now it's just the DMV. And uh, also, uh, for those that are also involved, like in helping out science activities in middle school or high school, there are some original from, I came from, I'm original from Nigeria, but I came from North Carolina. I was living in North Carolina before coming here. So while I was in graduate school in NC State, I found out a program, it's called a National Science Decathlon, where kids in middle school and high school participate in different activities and they get to go to like contests in different cities and also have a national competition that is all over the country. So anybody who's interested in that, because I was involved when my kids were in middle school, and even after I finished, I went, came back, I was doing my postdoc at UNC, the lady who was in charge of that program brought the current kids into my lab, and I showed them how you extract drugs from plants you know, like the columns, how those things are done, once you study different fractions, where you go next, how you finally, you know, and I gave an example as if anybody have ever heard of taxol and then they raise their hand. So locally we have a Pacific U plant in the lab that I was working on. Okay, this is the plant that the taxol came out of, you know, something, you know, simple like that. Cool. Uh, I like to kind of follow up on just the general concept of um, using some hook to get the attention of the kids. Um, asking those questions of, that, with which they may or may not be familiar, but presenting something that's not just pure science at the outside, just to grab them. Um, you know, like I said, I have not done any instruction with reset, uh, but I have a, I've probably been tutoring kids for about 16 years now, and back when I got started when I was in the Air Force, um, the hook that I had was aviation, right? So, because I, I flew airplanes, so I, I walk in a classroom, you know, flight suit, helmet, you know, G suit, that whole kind of thing, and just start talking generally about what I did, where I came from. Then start moving into, okay, here's a model of, the air, of an airplane. Has everyone seen an airplane? Yeah, sure. Okay, what is this? A wing. Okay, well, all right, so does anyone know how an airplane flies? You know, just starting with the basics, you know, and then you can start moving, you know, talking about the, you know, you know, the differentials and pressures because of the moving of the air over the wings and all this kind of things like this and the, and the whole body and the fuselage of the aircraft. So the key is, is is to present something to them and this is, these guys have been there, done it, and so have you. Start off your lessons with at a high enough level that they can just come into the story and wrap them into the story and then get into the details of the science. I've seen science instruction to kids go horribly wrong. Not in reset. <laughs> not in reset at all. Seriously, you laugh, but I've not seen it going to hold me wrong in reset. But where it goes horribly wrong, and this is just something to think about for folks who have not yet been in the classroom, is when you leap straight into the science. Bad answer. That's the wrong answer. You get a bad result. Come up with a story, why it's important to them, give them a context, give them a hook. You know, start off with the basics. Okay, 